Thank you everyone for joining us this evening, morning or afternoon, depending on which part of the world you're watching from. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is being recorded so that we can share the recording with alumni and friends who weren't able to join us today. We hope you're all safe and healthy. The pandemic has been a challenge for everyone and perhaps nutrition has taken a front row seat now, more than ever as we all would like to stay healthy and strong and boost our immune system. We hope our event today will help answer questions which you may have in terms of staying healthy. Is a high fat, low carb diet truly the healthier option or is this a fad? Are juice cleanses as healthy as it seems or is it better to fast once a week or would we be better off just simply skipping breakfast every day? Let's listen to our panel of experts who can help answer these questions. I would now like to introduce the moderator of the evening, Dr. Ian Ahn. Dr. Ahn, who graduated from Columbia with a PhD in behavioral nutrition, is a researcher at NUS Saw Sui Hawk School of Public Health, focusing on community-based health interventions and healthcare services, and on investigating the how infrastructure can help improve dietary habits and health. Dr. Ahn will now introduce our guest speakers this evening, Dr. Kyle Tan and Dr. Steve Tucker. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fact of Fat, Nutrition in 2020. As Mary introduced, my name is Ian Ahn, and I will be your moderator for today's session. So just a little bit about me, uh, as Mary shared, I'm currently a researcher at National University of Singapore, Swarsui Hawk School of Public Health. I graduated in 2017 and moved back to Singapore right after. I spent 12 years in New York, uh, lots of school, both in NYU and Columbia. Uh, back in New York, I co-led various studies, one evaluating the effects of a supermarket discount on fruits and vegetable sales and consumption, and um, a couple of school wellness programs uh, and their effects on consumption of school lunch and nutrition knowledge in elementary school kids. Uh, right now in Singapore, um, I've shifted more broadly to studies on novel healthcare intervention programs and the impact on patients' health and hospitalizations. So we hope that in our short one-hour session, you will gain some insights from my experts here today who can help separate fact from fiction in some recently popular aspects revolving diets and nutrition. So before we start, I would like to go through some um, ground rules as to how we will proceed with today's discussion in Q&A um, later on so that we're all prepared um, as we reach that section. So we will be using the Q&A function within Zoom. So if you're using a computer, this should be at the bottom of your Zoom window, the fourth button um, in the center of buttons. Uh, and throughout today's session, uh, you can start to post your questions in there and we will review and select them. If you would like to be the one to ask the question in person over um, Zoom, uh, please indicate at the front of the question in parentheses, ask myself. So this way uh, we can take note of those, uh, those that are interested in doing so. And if the question is selected, we will authorize you to unmute your microphone and be the one to ask your question in person. So this is to try to keep things um, a little bit more interactive with the webinar format. And if you don't indicate with this ask myself in front of um, your question, then I'll be the one to read the selected questions on your uh, behalf. So unfortunately, for those that are dialed in on the phone and not using the app or on a computer, you will not be able to have this ability to post questions with the Q&A function. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible to uh, this evening, but with limited time, we might not be able to cover them all. So um, we might also stop the Ask Myself style if technical difficulties um, start to hinder or delay the session. So we hope you all understand. So without further ado, uh, here we've uh, introduced today's esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Kyle Tan and Dr. Steve, uh, Stephen Tucker. I'll leave them to share more about themselves. So uh, first over to you, Dr. Kyle Tan. Thank you, Ian. Good evening, everyone. This is Kyle. I hope everyone is keeping safe and well at home. Uh, I'm a doctor, a specialist doctor in preventive medicine, and my clinical practice focuses on holistic management and prevention of chronic metabolic diseases such as diabetes. Uh, I've been practicing medicine in Singapore for the last 10 years. Last year, I left the public healthcare sector and co-founded Novi Health with two other physicians, one of whom is a Columbia alumni and the other a Penn alumni. I'm not sure why I'm the one speaking here today. Uh, 
At Novi Health, uh, we combine multidisciplinary clinical care with a team of nutritionists as well as uh, fitness coaches um, with technology to prevent, reverse, and manage chronic lifestyle diseases. We started Novi Health because we really felt strongly that chronic lifestyle diseases should not be focused solely on medical management. We can really do so much better these days by incorporating lifestyle management into the medical care that we deliver so that the care recipients can achieve better and more sustainable outcomes. Thank you for having me here today. I look forward to contributing to a fruitful discussion. I'll hand over to Steve to introduce himself. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, so usually I would ask, can everyone hear me? But it's so awkward being on Zoom sometimes. But I will just, uh, you know, go on until Ian shuts me up. I'm a, I'm a cancer specialist by training. And uh, listening to both Kyle and Ian, I start to feel very old since I entered medicine in 1989. Can't believe I've been doing this for three plus decades. But about a little more than 10 years ago, as a cancer doctor, I had an epiphany that if I was going to be, be good at my job, I wasn't just going to treat disease, but I was going to focus on preventing it. And a lot of epiphanies in my life, a lot of events in my life all fell in place around prevention. Building my practice here in Singapore, uh, I moved here in 06 to start a clinical trials program, an international clinical research program. I've now been here nearly 15 years, and it was about 10 years ago that I realized now I have an opportunity to build a, a program, a multidisciplinary program with nutrition and primary care, uh, like Kyle with uh, fitness and mental health providers, thinking about how to prevent disease. And it all came about because patients would come through Singapore wanting health screening, and they would be worried about cancer. And they would want to do something like a PET CT scan or something very expensive and very dangerous, when the reality was they needed to lose weight, they needed to stop smoking, they needed to sleep better. And it brings you down this road of nutrition and fitness and mental health and sleep. And you realize that there are so many different ways to approach the issue that you have to have a holistic view. And I would say a very open mind to how you achieve success, which kind of leads us back to what's a fact in nutrition and what's a fad and, and how does that really work? So being an oncologist, Ultimately, at the end of the day, to be a good preventive oncologist, you're kind of a weight loss doctor. Thanks. I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> All right. So um, we are going to start on um, the discussion with the panelists. And you can start to ask questions uh, using the Q&A feature of uh, Zoom. Reminder, if you would like to be the one to ask the question in person, please indicate at the front of the question in parentheses, ask myself. Uh, so let me just kickstart this discussion section uh, with a question. So uh, to the two panelists, um, diet crazes come and go, and there have been a few that have gained popularity the last few years, such as intermittent fasting, keto diet, paleo diets, plant-based plan diets. So what's your take on them, these different diets? You want to go first, Tal? Yep, sure. Yeah, thanks for the question, Ian. I think um, that's, you know, in my clinical practice, I think that's one of the most common questions that we get. Um, you know, if someone comes in, they're interested to lose weight, they often ask, you know, like, what is the best diet that I can have to lose weight? And I think what we must know is that in general, most diets have their benefits and their downsides. And I always tell them, you know, what's what's the best diet for you is not necessarily the best diet for me, but really what diet you can stick with and how we can work with you to help make that diet work for you. And usually what happens is that we'll, I'll look at a few different aspects, um, suitability for their preferences and their lifestyle, how, whether it appeals to their personality. And lastly, um, to take into account their health status and mitigate any downsides that their diet may have. So for example, if we're really looking at weight loss uh, as, an, as, as an example, um, you know, when, when we first look at preferences and lifestyle, what we'll be looking at um, is firstly, um, any dietary preferences. So you could be a meat lover, or you might be in, like in Singapore, someone who tends to consume a lot of carbs. 
then if you're someone who really likes carbs, trying to recommend, um, for example, a low carb diet could be very challenging. But again, I've been surprised by some of the people that come through. Um, but that's one of the things that we really have to take into account when we make a specific recommendation um, in terms of um, what sort of diet to go with. Um, another key, a key area is really cost issues. Um, I had one client tell me that they didn't realize how cheap it was to eat carbs compared to having a, a diet that's full of meat and vegetables. And that's something that also sometimes you have to take into account when you're making certain recommendations or choosing certain diets. The last aspect that's also important would be personal factors. So for example, um, if you're a business person that needs to entertain throughout the day, then recommending a diet that, that is like intermittent fasting may not work so well for you because you may need to consume foods maybe 12 hours a day um, at different time points. And so that trying to force fit that sort of diet into your lifestyle isn't going to work for you and it's not going to be very sustainable. Uh, the second area that uh, sometimes uh, I look at, which is quite important, is also personality. Um, we have some clients that are maybe super detailed, very, very type A. They like to feel in control. So uh, recommending a diet, that a calorie restricted diet, sometimes it works for these people because they like to count um, how much calories they're eating. You know, maybe a ketogenic diet works well for them as well because they like to be in control. They like to know, they have markers of, uh, they, they, they can measure whether they're in ketosis, they can count how much carbs, how much protein they're taking, how much fat they're taking, and they know they're on track. And so then these kind of diets sometimes work well for these people. Others maybe just want to keep it really, really simple. Uh, and sometimes something like um, intermittent fasting may work better for these people because then they just know, okay, I have this window, I just eat during this period, and then I don't eat um, for the rest of the day. Um, and lastly, what I talked about was um, looking at the downsides of some of the diet and taking into account their medical condition. So again, like for example, if you're adopting, like what you mentioned, a plant-based diet, um, we know that a plant-based diet can be challenging in terms of getting sufficient protein just purely because of the amount of, um, of, of food that you need to eat to get that amount of protein. Um, in addition, certain types of um, certain sources of, uh, of food within the plant-based diet may be lacking in certain amino acids. So you need to really cover all your bases, eat a variety of food to be able to make sure that you are still, you have the adequate nutrition that you want. For example, um, omega-3 fatty acids might be one of them. So really um, taking into account these considerations when you choose a diet is really um, important to make it work for you so that it's sustainable. You know, I hand over to Steve uh, right now. I don't know uh, what you think about it. I think my job is done. I, that was perfect. That's exactly what we like to do. No, I, I really do think you, you, you hit it the nail on the head because you have to personalize. And, but I sort of often take a step back and ask the patients somewhat tongue in cheek, why did they come here in the first place? So, you know, sort of people walk into my office and I, I, I jokingly say, why are you here? And they say, I hear you're a good weight loss doctor. I'm like, no, sit down. And then uh, they'll say, well, why are you here? And I'm like, I heard you're, you have a holistic practice. Like, no, sit down. And we keep pushing them, not, I mean, very tongue in cheek and they know that I'm, I'm teasing with them. But what I'm trying to get at is people don't, I ask them if they wanna lose weight and they say, yes. And then I argue that they don't want to lose weight because then I would offer to cut off an arm or a leg and say, now you weigh less. So people really don't want to lose weight. What they want to lose is fat or they want to feel better or they want to look good naked or they want to run faster. I always think I have to get to why are you interested in changing the way you eat in order to get what? And so once I can find out what your motivation is, then I would follow the exact same plan that you lay out, Kyle, to find one that works. You've got oil traders in Singapore who have to buy a bottle of whiskey for their clients every night. You've got individuals with, with a very lean budget where fasting is a perfect option for them. Um, but you have to get to root motivation as much as you then get to root cause. Because then the, the next approach that I take, regardless of the diet, regardless of sort of which fad they're interested in, 
is that I point out, okay, so you want to lose fat. Now I have to explain to you, how did you get the fat? Because there are 10,000 books written on how to lose weight. But there's, in my opinion, only one book on how to get fat. And people are like, what? What book is that? And you have a copy, Kyle. Ian, you probably have a copy. And that's medical physiology. The only way to really create new fat as an adult is through the hormone insulin. So then you get down the path of what makes insulin go up and glucose makes insulin go up, what makes glucose go up. And obviously carbohydrates make glucose go up in your body, but also stress, not just psychological stress, but physical stress, triathlon training, staying up all night, jet lag. And so you really have to get to an individual's root motivation and then teach them the root cause, which tends to be excess insulin. Kyle's clinic, his whole group is entirely focused on the diseases that come from excess insulin and reversing them. It's the same thing that we do at Tucker Medical, but with the focus really around oncology, that's where we started because it's a risk factor for cancer care uh, and cancer relapse. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, Ian, but I think for those who are listening that kind of want to see sparks between different diets, that's probably not going to happen between Kyle and I tonight. Right. So I think both of you have touched on sort of a very key point on, um, you know, it, it really comes to understanding the client and understanding what works for them and sort of having this sort of customization of, you know, what are the motivations behind um, why they're there? What are the factors push and pull uh, to get them to where they are and where they want to go? Um, so in, you know, uh, I'll maybe circle to some of the um, uh, questions that I'm seeing coming up as well and, and, and other aspects, but, you know, I want to touch on this a little bit. So, you know, what is your experience um, in both of your businesses with, with really trying to um, tap on this, this aspect of um, personalization and experience? Like what, what makes someone tick and what, you know, doesn't, you know, if we sort of try to like extract that, that aspect to try to DIY on ourselves, like what, what in your experience works for your clients to, to really make them achieve sustained um, progress in, in managing the nutrition and the health? So if I understand the question, what are the tricks of the trade? How do you get someone hooked? Yeah. Well, or, or whatever you can disclose that, <laughs> that you don't want to give away. It's, it's public knowledge. This is, you're, you're in public health. So the more people that, that can hear this, the better. Um, I'll tell you one of the things I love about the keto diet is how extreme it is. That, and, and honestly, veganism is extreme. And, carnivore is extreme. I'm a big fan of extreme diets, but I'm going to put a caveat around that, a big asterisk. I'm not sure that that's what I would want to do for the rest of my life, but I think that if you live your life for 30 days, if you, you know, say, listen, all I'm going to do is eat animals for 30 days, animal products. I'm going to have salmon and eggs for breakfast, and I'm gonna have roast chicken for lunch, and I'm gonna have a, a sirloin for dinner. That's not suffering, it's boring. And you'll get all the nutrients and protein that you want. And for those who say, well, I'm worried about you know, the hormones or I'm worried about the production quality, um, I hear you, but 30 days out of 80 years is nothing. But what you learn in a 30-day experiment on yourself really um, becomes useful because a lot of these people who are trying to lose weight, what happens is that they've lost confidence. And if you can give them confidence that they can do something like walk a thousand steps a day or go from couch to 5K or, hey, I was a vegan for 30 days. Here's what I learned about it. It's highly motivating. And I think the support that we give, that my staff gives, helps create an important support and stickiness that's so critical uh, to the individual success. They have to know they're not alone. And, and putting them out on what seems like an extreme, but supporting them while they do it, uh, has been a really positive experience. Kyle, 
pause. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, what, what Steve has said is really interesting because um, I think what you said earlier about trying to understand the individual's motivation is, I think, very, very key for, um, for us as well when we look at anyone that comes in to the practice. Um, in terms of then how I execute it, uh, I've taken a slightly different approach um, to what you've um, described. I find that I find it very difficult to, um, to, to put someone through a very extreme diet right from the get-go. I, I do see the benefit. I, I, do, I do understand what you're trying to say here. And uh, that, that's a, an approach that's really interesting. And I think if that can be done, that, that really can help to unlock some of the barriers that they can face um, in the longer term. And that's really, that's really very interesting. Um, I can describe a little bit of um, how, how we do it. Um, um, with the same sort of principle really um, when someone steps in to the clinic door trying to understand um, what is the motivation that why are they here um, are they ready for any sort of change at all um, at this point in time if sometimes i find that hey this guy is just here trying to find out a little bit more about how to lose weight not quite ready to make any sort of changes i don't try to drag them to the door i still leave the door open and say hey you can come back again anytime um, but you have to be ready to change because it's really difficult to try to make someone go through a huge change, especially for something as personal as their diet, when I feel like maybe they're just, just not ready at that point in time. Um, uh, and really then um, making sure that they're ready and they're, they're ready to go um, when we want to start on something. Um, in terms of then like trying to understand what uh, their motivations are, I can give you some examples of patients that we do see in our practice. Take, two, take an example of someone with um, diabetes. Um, we know that it is possible, at especially at the early stages, to reverse diabetes. Um, and that could be done through very strict um, sort of low carb diet where you start to reverse some of that insulin resistance. But there are trade-offs. It means that you have to drastically change the kind of diet that you're on. Um, I have had clients who come in, they're keen to do that. And they understand that that means that really you have to be ready to go on that sort of extreme diet that you, that you want to. And then we put them on that sort of diet. But then on the other hand, I have some, um, some clients um, and they understand that, hey, uh, I, really, I really, they tell me, uh, I really enjoy my food. And that's not something that I'm ready to give up at this point in time. Then they sort of have to realize that that's a trade-off. If you still want to manage your diabetes, then that may mean that you need to be on medication for a period of time until maybe you're ready to change. And then we sort of then adjust based on that. And, and, and I don't know, Steve, what you think about this, but the second part um, to my answer would be, uh, usually one of the questions that I ask my clients is, um, is this something that you feel that you can do for the rest of your life? And I think um, to your answer just now, you mentioned, hey, this is a period of time where it's an extreme diet and then I'm going to move you to something else, right? I, I, it sounds like kind of what you, you want to do. Is that is that right? Well, I think it's, I, I, I don't want to come across that that's what we do. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of the spectrum of options sure. that you discuss with patients. And as you're personalizing, there are some people who quit smoking cold turkey. And there are those people that count the number of sticks per day and reduce by a period of time and they're very gradual. The challenge for you and me in our practices is to determine the personality of the client and which of those strategies is going to be successful at this time because what works now doesn't necessarily work a year from now or worked a year ago. So I, I think there's a lot of personalization that comes from feedback from being given those options. Um, I, I'll, I'll throw in here, I have as also um, the, one of the things that got me convinced to be doing this as, as, as passionately as, as we do in the office is uh, I have oncology patients and they're always looking for A, why did this happen? And how can I prevent it from coming back? And I think that medicine has done a disservice to the community by saying, by overly relying on some of our randomized trials that don't give specific results and are difficult to even interpret. But the studies that say, well, is, is fat good, is fat bad? 
Is low carb good? Is low carb bad? Is organic good? Is organic bad? And I think we all get confused because on Monday I read in the paper that coffee kills and on Tuesday I read in the paper that coffee saves lives and we don't even have to get into vitamin D and vitamin C and all these other things. And so it's really hard to interpret. But what's important is how do you lose fat and what's the role of insulin in driving chronic disease? So when you can, you know, the luxury you and I have we've created medical practices that, that allow for time for communication between doctors and nurses, nutritionists, trainers, and the client, whether it's the patient or the client, but it takes time to speak with them, to listen to them, to support them. And that's the real luxury and the success. That's the secret sauce is listening to people and giving them options. So it's not always about extreme diets, but I will say, if you're game, I'm in. I will support you. We have seen, and, and maybe the audience you know, out there can, can ask some questions, but so we have, I know there's a question in the Q&A about um, what's our take on the carnivore diet. And I, I love the carnivore diet, okay? I, I've not been very personally successful with it um, in terms of sticking to it. But we've had patients with autoimmune disease who come into the office, severe psoriasis and arthritis, and food allergies, and can young, young men, fitness trainers, who literally are being disabled. And we put them on a carnivore diet. They thought we were crazy. But it works like a charm. And what the thing about a carnivore diet, it's all about the labeling and the marketing. Because if you went to a nutritionist with a rash and they said, you need to do an elimination diet and we're going to take away a bunch of these foods and then slowly add them back. Well, that's actually a carnivore diet. It could be. You could make it a vegan. You, you're just reducing all of the things that you eat to a few core items, seeing how you feel, and then adding them back slowly. So um, I, I think that it's it's really just kind of um, a luxury. And, you know, I credit Singapore and kind of the system here that, that we can push the boundaries of what, what I think the future of healthcare will be. Because, and I know there's other questions coming about this, obesity, diabetes, hypertension are all huge risk factors for um, problems with COVID-19. That, that, that the same metabolic health we're focused on, whether it's a fat or a fat, is a huge contributor to those people who have the most risk with the pandemic virus. All right, I'll pause. So, so Steve, um, maybe you can touch a little bit about, um, you know, so what's the whole discussion with red meat and cancer? And then if we're talking about ketogenic diet, um, you know, is that effective for cancer treatment? Um, uh, you know, be it lung cancer or any type of cancer. So just, just sort of like broadly, is there, is there a science behind it? What, what do you buy into? Um, do you sort of just, you know, experiment different approaches of different diets? And that is really, again, back to the point that there's no one true solution. So I think that the true solution, the, the most important teaching is to understand the relationship between glucose and insulin. So insulin is, is the devil in our story here, is the, is the antagonist. Insulin is the problem, and anything that provokes it is going to be driving disease. That said, red meat is a complicated pair of words. What if I rephrase red meat to animal protein? And so a lot of, first of all, I think that nutrition is filled with errors in epidemiology. That you, when studies are done for nutrition, that require dietary recall, as in, knock on the door, tell me what you ate for the last three days, that's great. I'll be back in three years, tell me what you ate three years ago. Nutrition research is deeply flawed. That, that said, that doesn't mean you can do anything you want or that we ignore the studies, but most of the red meat studies have methodologic problems. But I can also say, all right, skip the red meat, eat chicken, right? And I think that overall, everyone is looking 
understandably for the easy way out. Can I just take this pill? If I just eat organic, if I just did, you know, one other thing. And the reality is we're all eating too much. We're all eating too much processed food. And we're all eating too often. And so we need to be cutting back where we can. And food is, an, in theory, an easy place to do it. But in practice, food, especially in Singapore, I mean, what do we, what do we love about Singapore? We've got, we love, you know, when, 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 without pandemic, we love Singapore Airlines, we love travel, and we love food, right? What are the best things about Singapore? And it's really hard to get people to, to stop eating kuei chiu. It's hard to get everyone to eat more bakute. <laughs> it's, I mean, there, there, there are ways to eat in Singapore that reduce carbs, but it's such a social, familial, and comforting part of our lifestyle that um, we lose sight of what's in, how to eat if you just focus on the red meat discussion. And but just to close it out, if you're truly worried about the red meat and cancer association, it's mostly around gastrointestinal cancers. Um, and you, like I said, you can just eliminate red meat, but you can eat eggs, you can eat other proteins. So I wouldn't fall into the trap of a tiny portion of your macronutrients as opposed to thinking holistically about what your food choices are. Thanks, Steve. So, you know, there was a mention about, you know, insulin and blood glucose levels. So I wanted to ask Kyle um, a question from um, some of our attendees. Um, you know, is, is juice cleanse a bad diet? So, you know, how does that affect the insulin levels and blood glucose levels? Um, um, you know, and, and then, you know, in contrast with that, intermittent fasting, um, you know, if that's done, um, is that better than, uh, than having liquid diets? Um, yeah. So what are your takes on intermittent fasting, juice cleanse, fasting in general? Go for it, Kyle. Right. Okay. So, I mean... When it comes to um, a juice cleanse, um, very often, you know, that's a quick way for people who want to lose weight, um, and they, and they then they, they then take that juice cleanse, right? But at the bottom of it, it's really just being a super low calorie diet that you're on for a week, and of course, you're going to lose some weight, and most of it coming from water weight and maybe some muscle as well. Um, in terms of how healthy juices are, um, I mean, when you look at food that you're consuming. If you're consuming a whole fruit, um, you have a certain amount of fiber that is in that fruit. Okay, so maybe you compare an, uh, taking an orange and a cup of orange juice, right? So um, an orange maybe has maybe 10 grams of um, carbs or sugar in it, but there's a lot of fiber that's in there. There are a lot of other micronutrients that are in that orange. When you take that orange, the how quickly your sugar goes up is a function of how much sugar there is and how quickly that's digested. Because that orange has um, fiber in that, the, the sugar spike that results from you eating an orange is gonna be a, a graph that's, like, that's fairly slow compared to if you were just to take orange juice, which has two issues, right? To make a cup of orange juice, how many oranges do you need? Maybe four oranges? you're stripping away the fiber, you're basically just concentrating that sugar in that bottle of juice. And when you take that in, you're basically eating four oranges at a go, which is not something that you would do normally. Um, and that's a high amount of sugar because the load is so high. And without that fiber, you're gonna cause your sugars to really increase very, very quickly. And what that happens then uh, to what Steve talked about, uh, is that that stresses your body, it makes you produce a high amount of insulin to counteract that amount of sugar that's going up. And that has other knock-on effects, where, um, which is the side effects of um, insulin. So um, juices, yeah, that's, uh, that's the downside to taking juices compared to taking whole fruits. Uh, and I think the second part of your question was around um, intermittent fasting and how that can benefit someone. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, there are numerous studies uh, that have uh, been done on intermittent fasting, um, and there are a few mechanisms that uh, have been proposed as to why they, they are beneficial. Uh, they have been shown to be effective in weight loss, I think by virtue of the fact that you are fasting for um, a large part of the day, 
uh, you already cut down on the amount of calories um, that you're consuming. Uh, and secondly, the other uh, hypothesis is that um, by fasting for a longer period of time, you're actually reducing the amount of time that your body is in um, at a state where there's higher amounts of insulin because every time you eat, you, your body produces insulin to counteract that sort of um, rise in glucose levels. So um, the longer that you're fasting, the shorter amount of duration that your body's in that state where you have higher amounts of insulin, which can result in weight loss, uh, in weight gain if your insulin levels are higher. So that's another mechanism that it kind of works. I don't know, Steve, do you have anything else to add to that? Well, let me back, backtrack to the first part of the question. Hmm. Um, one thing about juice, if you're a diabetic, like a type 1 diabetic taking insulin, and say you've taken too much insulin, what is the first thing that the doctors and nurses will give an individual to raise their blood sugar? Juice. <laughs> Nothing raises blood sugar faster than juice. Mm. So a juice diet, um, it, it, a, you know, a juice cleanse, that's, it's just, you might survive it. You'll, you, you'll probably be fine. But as a concept, it's pretty much the wrong thing to do. It, it, it just, just plain and simple. In my opinion, that's the wrong thing to do. With regard to fasting, fasting is fascinating because uh, you can really provoke individuals with the word fasting depending upon the duration of the fast. Um, we all fast, ideally. We fast overnight. The word break fast, I mean, that's supposed to be the morning. Um, right now, you know, everyone is celebrating Ramadan across Singapore and fasting is commonplace every day. It's also a huge risk for some f individuals or families for binging, right? So fasting is followed by breaking the fast. And so it's not so much about what you're not eating, it's always about what you're eating. And, and when you're not eating, you're not provoking your hormones. You're not provoking insulin. Now, you can fast overnight and that's normal. And there are very good studies to show that overnight fasting of 12 to 14 hours is associated with better, a variety of better outcomes in terms of weight loss or cardiac disease or cancer. When you start to extend that to 14 hours, there are even better studies in oncology for reducing the risk of breast cancer relapse for a 14 hour overnight fast. Now, what if you go for three days or five days of fasting? Uh, you know, adequate water, uh, hydration, but what's the real benefit around fasting and why is it popular? The scientific theory is that fasting provokes a process called autophagy, which is one of the ways that cells die. Um, cells die through necrosis, like you get bit by a poisonous snake and your cells are dying or they die through apoptosis, which is a nor considered normal cell suicide. That's the failure in HIV that, that you know, the, there's, there's no uh, increase ap apoptosis in B cells. And then there's autophagy, which is the recycling of cells, where the cells are supposed to die. Now, here's where it gets slightly tricky. Cells are born and cells die all the time. But in science, very broadly and crudely, you can break cells into the daughter cells and the, grand, the grandma cells or the grandparent cells. And those are kind of the stem cells. What you're trying to achieve with three to five days of fasting is actually to kill the old stem cells. Stem cells don't die or get into cell reproduction very easily. Only during the stress of, of fasting do you induce autophagy where you're both killing the old stem cells and regenerating or rejuvenating new stem cells? That, that is the best way to sort of describe what extended fasting for three to five days will do is it's rejuvenation for stem cells in your gut, in your brain, in your bone marrow. That's really, it's getting rid of the old stem cells that may have accumulated genetic damage and stimulating the regrowth of new stem cells that hopefully are healthier. One last thing on the fasting. We use fasting in oncology in, in our practice every day. 
we've developed based on published literature a clinical fasting protocol around chemotherapy so it turns out that most classic chemotherapy works by interfering with the way cells divide and cells that are moving more quickly than others are cancer cells but also our bone marrow and our gut stem cells are moving quickly so when you're fasting for say 24 hours before chemo and 24 hours after, what happens is you get a double benefit. The cancer cells ignore the stimulus of fasting. Cancer cells are running at high speed all the time, but your healthy cells get the message and they slow down. So there's less effect of the chemotherapy on the healthy cells. At the same time, since your blood sugar is normalizing and lower, the cancer cells, which can only utilize glucose, are going to incorporate more chemotherapy than the regular cells. So you get a double benefit. You get less toxicity and more cell killing. And that's been borne out in, in laboratory petri dishes, in small animals, and in human studies. And uh, you know, we've been pretty fanatical about offering, teaching, applying this fasting protocol. And we also do, and I'm sure Kyle can talk to this, a fasting mimicking protocol um, that we, for people who don't really want to fast, we give them 500 or 800 calories of basically fiber and, you know, non, you know, low protein, uh, high fiber based, let them chew and, and things like bone broth. But fasting, like so many things is, it all depends upon the duration. And it, mostly, it's all good. All right, thanks, Steve. So uh, maybe I'll circle back to um, some point, uh, Kyle. I think you know you talked about insulin and you know why it's not good to have the spike. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on on that and sort of like what the concern is with insulin in general. Um, with, you know, without being too medical about it, and also uh, touch a little bit on um, what's the relation with thyroid health and whether there's sort of diets out there that address thyroid autoimmune, if you're familiar with, um, and if not, sort of what your thoughts are? Sure. Um, maybe I'll cover the aspect around meta metabolic health, because um, that's the area that I'm uh, more familiar with. So um, I think the classical teaching for um, you know, why people develop diabetes, um, it tends to be a multi-step process where people start developing insulin resistance, meaning that your body becomes uh, less sensitive to the insulin that you're producing. And then um, your body then compensates by making more and more insulin. And then at some point, um, your body fails to produce sufficient insulin. And that's where you can't regulate the glucose anymore and you get, you get diabetes. So that's been well studied. And um, that's been a lot of these studies have been done in Caucasian populations, and that's been the sort of um, epidemiology and pathophysiology that we're familiar with. But what we're increasingly seeing is that um, in Asia, there's actually a different sort of um, phenotype where the, you have this very skinny Asian ladies or even men who have type 2 diabetes and at a fairly young age, and, and, and we're starting to see a lot more of that. And a lot of that happens without so much of insulin resistance, they're not putting on a lot of weight and then developing, um, going down the path of insulin resistance and then developing diabetes. But sometimes um, they have an issue with production of insulin, meaning that even though they are skinny and maybe they're not so resistant to insulin, they have, a dif they have difficulty producing sufficient insulin to regulate the sugar levels and they then get diabetes when they put on just that little bit more of weight because they're just a little bit more resistant than they were before that. And we don't fully quite understand what the reason is, but part of the suspicion is that um, being in Asia, the diet is very high in refined carbohydrates and that tends to cause these huge spikes again in sugar and it places a certain amount of stress on the pancreas to produce a lot of insulin in a short amount of time to try to re bring the sugar levels down. And that, repeat, that happens repeatedly. It stresses out the pancreas and it, up to a certain point, your pancreas sort of doesn't function as well as it did before. 
and therefore you then develop prediabetes and then progress to diabetes. And that's sort of um, a different sort of uh, mechanism or pathophysiology in the Asian population that we're sort of um, seeing here. And then to your point about why this is important um, to avoid these huge spikes, it's because we, we logically, we know that um, these spikes, they, they, they actually stress your pancreas. It puts you at increased risk of developing these metabolic diseases. And it puts your body in a state where you know, there are these huge spikes of um, insulin, which then have these other um, effects. Can I ask uh, Kyle a question to come further on that? Yep. So what do you also see? I'm, I'm sure you'll answer what I'm thinking. Mm. It's not just that spike and the disease process. What about the changes in the gut and the microbiome and the neuropeptides that make you want to eat that again? That you, you know, it, it, it changes your mental health. And there's, because it gets back to stress and stress response. I'm so stressed out that I really need to have, you know, um, I don't know, goldfish and a margarita right? Um, that I, I need, you know, some kind of chips. I need gummy bears. And your glucose goes up and then it crashes, but you also get that compensation of dopamine and neuropeptides in your brain and serotonin that make you happy, just like narcotics. And it perpetuates a cycle. And, and the insulin is just such an obvious part of that cycle that if you can cut it out, um, you're, you're moving in a direction of health as opposed to a more slippery slope. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're right. well, I mean, I think, which is why I think like earlier on, you mentioned whether or not, you know, some people go at it like a like cold turkey when you quit smoking. That's kind of like exactly what this could be as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So thank you both for addressing some of those questions. So I think we've sort of gone a little bit um, disease centric for a while now, and I want to like shift gears to more general, um, you know, health and wellness for you know, for I guess most of our attendees are hopefully yeah. not, you know, with long term chronic diseases. So you know, a lot of questions that I'm seeing here revolve around you know, there's a lot of trendy diets out there. You know, there's always gonna be talks of, hey, you know, go organic. You know, eat this or eat that to get more micronutrients. Um, alkaline water, alkaline diet, eating foods that, you know, raise your pH of your blood without getting too technical or medical, um, you know, so just, I just want to hear, you know, what are your thoughts on all of this? What's their relationship to diabetes, to cancer? What's the, what are your thoughts and what's the evidence out there and how do you feel about it when people come to you and, and what's the approach that you would take? I'm going to take alkaline oh. diet. Okay. Sorry? Great, great. Alkaline diet is a great way to make money if you're selling the alkaline diet. Otherwise, it's pointless. Right. Um, That's it. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll, take the, I'll take the organic versus non-organic <laughs> diet part. Um, I think there are some benefits. Um, there are some foods that it makes sense to take an organic sort of food purely because of the amount of pesticides that are used to farm the foods otherwise. So things like apples, maybe strawberries, peaches, grapes, they can have a lot of um, pesticides. So that's, if you're concerned about consuming high amounts of pesticides, um, choosing organic options may work. There are some that just doesn't make sense, like avocados, bananas. I mean, you're not gonna be eating the skin, right? So, and the amount of pesticides they use to grow these foods, there are a lot less. So less of a concern um, for poultry, uh, non-organic options can have a lot of antibiotics. So then there are side effects from consuming some of these. So, I mean, there are some advantages to taking um, organic foods if you can sort of afford it. Great. The, I totally agree. And I think the teaching that I, that I got and I give is, um, think of the, how long it takes to produce the product. The amount of concentration of pesticides in animal products is significantly higher than the concentration or surface amount of pesticides in fruits and vegetables. And you can wash your fruits and vegetables. Uh, you can't wash the cells of your chicken thigh. So um, if you want to make an investment in organic, non-organic, usually your dairy products, your animal products are better to, to go with the organic and more expensive. 
buy your vegetables from Malaysia and wash them well, and uh, <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So uh, I think I want to also touch a little bit on the whole weight management aspect. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, if we achieve weight loss, there's better uh, uh, results for diabetes control, uh, you know, better reduction in risk of cancer. So what, you know, if, what are some of the um, aspects of, you know, why it's hard for people, uh, you know, how, how you approach it differently for men and women, uh, women that are going into menopause, um, you know, and, and you know, in terms of the people that you know really want to work what's losing weight, losing fat, but don't want to you know, give up the good food that we have in Singapore, how do you balance all of this simultaneously? Kyle? Kyle? Hello? Okay. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, very often, uh, the approach, I think we've covered a lot of the key tenets about how we want to personalize for the individual. Um, how do you understand what the underlying motivations are to try to design something that works well for that person? Um, one of the other things that, um, that I tend to do is really trying to start with um, very small changes and quick wins for that individual. Um, again, it comes to, it's very hard to generalize what works at large because um, we all know what we need to do. We just need to cut down on the amount of calories that you're taking, increase your output. Um, but again, it's, it's exactly how do you do that for this person that makes it work or not work. Um, and I can give you an example of someone whom, um, that I saw recently and um, what kind of small little changes that we made, right? So this person, I mean, he came and he really wanted to lose weight, but he also really liked certain, he had a really um, peculiar diet where I think at about 10 o'clock every night, he had to have his cup of Milo with either a prata or a cake just because he loves to snack and that's <laughs> and it's basically taking a lot of refined sugar and carbs in the middle of the night right and then that's his mother now well unfortunately he's 45 i think with a few kids so my milo my milo and my prata at 10 o'clock at night okay yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is that, you know, he really loves it. So he actually told me like, you know, I really don't think I can cut that out because I really, really liked it. But then when you try to dig a little bit deeper to understand what the root cause is, besides being a comfort food, also his dinner was just um, a bowl and a half of white rice with like a little piece of meat that's probably like, I don't know if you can see, like this big. And so no wonder he's hungry by 8.30 and by 10 o'clock, he has no more willpower to resist taking that supper. So how do you, how do you then deal with this, right? Um, it wasn't trying to tell him, hey, do not take your prata and your milo, even though I'm so tempted to tell him that. But like really at dinner, um, I told him, why don't you try to add some vegetables and eat more meat? And so, I mean, that's a lot easier to shift that mindset to eat a little bit more um, so he doesn't feel like he's being tortured, right? So he slowly added that in. He felt a lot more full and he didn't feel the need to eat at 10 o'clock anymore. And so he started to cut out some of these like little snacks. And we know that, you know, introducing more protein and more fiber to his diet is actually beneficial. The protein helps him to build additional muscles, especially if he's doing exercise and um, the fiber keeps him fuller longer. And so like, just like something simple, like shifting like this um, can actually make a big impact. Um, if I guess if there was one thing that I would recommend to most people, it's really looking at the proportion on your plate. I think a typical Singaporean, it tends to be like maybe 70% carbs with like maybe 10% protein and 20% fiber. It's really just increasing the proportion of protein and vegetable that you're taking and reducing the amount of carbs. I think it's just starting with that can already make a big impact on, on eating healthier and even losing a little bit of weight. I think that that's a great story, um, especially when you, you're digging. Oh, I think Steve, Steve froze. Ask, what's the cause of my dinner being prepared the way it is? Uh, you, you really, I mean, a lot of people are eating out of frustration. Uh, I, I, I would get back to the mental health piece. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, I, I started my practice with myself and two nurses 10 years ago. And now we have this whole team of nutritionists and counselors. And the, the reality is you, you suddenly come across the reality that 
every most people know what to do, but they need the assistance, the behavior change. That knowledge isn't enough to make them lose weight or change what they're doing, and and resources, money, and you know access is not enough. They have to have an understanding and a motivation and a support system to get them through it, to, to really get to root cause. That people, why do you go out and have, I'm always fascinated if somebody says, you know, I ask them, why did you have that Milo at 2 p.m. with a, you know, with cookies? Like I needed the energy. No one needs the energy. You don't wake up and need energy. And I don't understand, you know, adult athletes, unless they're Olympians who need to eat before they go to the gym because we have the energy. And so what energy is code for is motivation or depression. And they're frustrated at work. They're annoyed with their boss. They're bored in some way. So they go and they eat. And so really getting to root cause is, is critical to helping people make different choices that help them achieve their goals. But that's a great story, Kyle. That, that's really good. Yeah. So I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, trying to get at the, good, the, the diets that work for the clients, for the, the public to lose some weight because then that's about a better health. What about this notion of um, health at every size? So I think there's a lot of uh, conversation around this movement now about health at every size. You know, it's not just about the weight. You know, you could, you could have a higher BMI, but really, you know, it's, it's maybe more muscle mass or, you know, your, your, the distribution of the fat is at different spots. And so it's, it's um, this conversation that, you know, someone can still be very fit, very healthy, their butt work still, um, you know, it's, it's as good as anyone or, you know, in contrast with someone that, you know, might be thin, but have, um, you know, skinny fat and blood glucose. Yeah. So, you know, so there's this, this discussion and what are your thoughts? Do you want to chime in a little bit on, on this um, understanding of the notion sure. of health on every side? Um, never judge the book by its cover. Mm -hmm. That that's it right there. Mm -hmm. And I think that the future of health, different than the future of medicine, is going to be a marriage of how functional you are, as as and married to what are your numbers. So you need, no matter what size you are, tall tall, short, wide, thin, whatever, you shouldn't have elevated blood sugars. That you might have a waist circumference or a BMI. I, I, I'm, you know, sort of a short, stocky, former wrestler. And even at my leanest, my body mass index still tips into the overweight range. And, and body mass index, you know, from public health, it has problems but it is the most cost-effective measure of health that we have. I mean, it's cheap, so it's cost-effective. Waist circumference is a better marker. Um, if, you could, if money was not an issue, Kyle and I would measure on everyone, the, the hemoglobin A1C, their insulin glucose ratios, the GGT, the ferritin, the liver enzymes. And, and it's actually a short panel of information to assess metabolic health. But you have to marry this metabolic health kind of equation. Here are my numbers. Then there's your mental health. How do I feel? I, I might be large. I might be, by People Magazine standards, not where I want to be. Or like my clients who come in who are honest and say, I just want to look good naked. I mean, that's great. I mean, it makes life easier because I'm like, well, I'm a plastic surgeon. You know, we can achieve these goals. I, I don't care how we achieve them. It's my job to lay out the risks and benefits of how to achieve it. But I can't do anything if I don't know what your goals are. And, and so I think you can't judge the book by its cover. You have to know your numbers. But I think you also have to think about how do you feel navigating life? Are you comfortable in the skin you inhabit? And if you're not, then I'll try to help you find a way to feel more comfortable. And Kyle, do you have something to add? 
No, I think Steve covered everything. I think we have quite a lot of questions to get through. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're just about hitting eight. We're going to extend our session by about 10 more minutes, and we're going to try to do some rapid question coverage uh, right now for uh, to try to make sure we get through as many of these as possible. So, all right, quick thoughts. Um, epigenetics and nutrition, customization on diet. Thoughts? Kyle, um, take it. Kyle? Epigenetics. Yeah. Um, I think that's circle like, DNA. that's a, sorry? Circle DNA, customization of diets, thoughts. Right. Um, so I've had a few clients who have gone through some of these epigenetic studies. Um, I think for nutrition, I find it really difficult. I don't know about you, Steve, but I really find it very difficult to try to make use of that information to advise on the sort of diet that, that they should be taking. Um, primarily because a lot of these are association studies that have multiple, like, so when you look at the association between this gene and what you should be taking, uh, that's based on a population study and how that applies to you as an individual. It's going to be, uh, I mean, it's just, it's a binary, right? It's either yes or no. Um, and it's, it's a tarot and, card. Be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. If I want to be brutal, it's, yes. <laughs> it's, I mean, these are, this is cool. It's exciting. I, I, we do genetics all day long. I'm an oncologist. We've been doing genetics, cancer genetics, pedigrees. We do a lot of genetics. I, you know, this is part of my, my life in terms of technology. And as much as I want it to be true, it, what you're seeing in circle DNA and otherwise are not genes, but traits. And you're seeing association studies. And as much as we want epigenetics and genetics and, uh, my personalized diet to be based on my DNA or my methylation or some other factor, my telomeres, the reality is we're not there yet. We should okay. keep trying, but you shouldn't be spending any money on DNA telling you how to eat. You should be spending money on looking at your insulin and ferritin and fatty livers. Okay. What about, uh, we know we talked about liquid diets for a bit just now. So what about meal replacements? You know, things like Soylent and uh, liquid meals. Can any, is Soylent still around? Did it survive? I think so. Yeah. I'm okay. No, I don't, I don't advocate drinking your meals. I think we should chew. I think it, that, that meal replacement, there are some individuals, the same, probably the same people who quit smoking cold turkey that, you know, if there are plenty of people where food is just nutrition, it's checking into a, petrol station, getting some energy and moving on. They don't have the same social culinary relationship. If that's the case, it's probably okay, but you still have to look at your numbers to see that A, you're not doing harm, that it's a real meal replacement, and that it's not boomeranging on you and making you suddenly go to KFC, you know, Jollibee late at night because all you had was an MRE, um, you know, at lunch. Yeah, pre pre the, I echo what Steve said. Uh, I think it, the preference is definitely for whole foods or real foods. There are a small group of um, individuals that sometimes I think it works well for them. If, for example, someone is eating very, very poorly, basically eating junk food for lunch because they're too busy, um, that might be an option for them if they really can't get proper food. Then that actually might be a better meal than eating a bunch of chips, for example. All right. So I know COVID-19 is a lot, a lot on a lot of people's minds. So, you know, very quickly, is there any sort of foods or diet that can help boost the immune system? What vitamins or food should you be taking? Quick thoughts. So um, there is one thing that is better than everything else for improving your immunity. It's sleep. Sleep is the single best thing to improve your immunity. There is not a, a food product that will significantly improve your immunity. Um, speaking with the cancer hat, people taking lots and lots of supplements and thinking about food, vitamins, and a holistic view. I will say that, that most mushroom products, well, reishi, lingzi, shiitake, well, any sort of version of mushrooms tends to enhance immunity, um, at, at least in a Petri dish, in a scientific study, and there are no downsides. But I can't tell you that buying very expensive Japanese mushrooms is going to prevent COVID. 
um, any more than taking enough zinc. That's the thing that comes up a lot, zinc and vitamin C. Zinc is proven to help reduce by 50% the uh, seasonal influenza, but you have to take enough zinc to induce diarrhea. So you, you make the call. Right. So Kyle, what do you think about, you know, getting the vitamins and minerals and micronutrients from food as opposed to supplements? What are your thoughts? So that's an interesting question. I think um, in general, the guidelines don't recommend that you take any sort of supplements um, as, as long as you're taking a, 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 a a varied and well-balanced sort of diet. Of course, in specific populations, maybe malnutrition, then that comes into play. However, that being said, um, there are quite a few interesting studies out there that show that the micronutrient and even macronutrient content of food, meaning the same food, like the same apple that you maybe ate 20 years ago versus the same apple that you're eating now, the content of micronutrients has dropped quite a fair bit. So eating the same amount of food may actually re result in you getting insufficient micronutrients. And the, there are a few hypotheses. Um, one is the agricultural practices. There are a lot faster crop cycles right now. So while you get the food, maybe they don't pick up as much of the micronutrients. Um, and there's no rest, it's just farming practices. You don't actually rest the soil in between um, crop cycles. So um, even if you're eating the same amount of food, sometimes um, you may not be getting that amount of micronutrients. And if you know taking a supplement isn't that expensive and it's a good supplement, um, I mean, why not, right? All right, so maybe I'll just wrap it up with one last question, uh, or one topic area, um, you know, with the stay at home, uh, right now that everyone's going through, what are some of your tips and what about um, exercise? You know, what's, what's the role? And uh, I know Steve, you talked about sleep. So that's the other aspect of exercise. Want to touch on that a little bit? So what we recommend to our patients, whether it's oncology or uh, weight loss, uh, chronic disease prevention, is first of all, that Diet and nutritional choice probably outweigh the benefits of exercise. Um, I, I, I used to tell everyone, I, I mean, when I, when I started all this, I would talk about the four pillars. Yeah, you're, you're, it's nutrition, it's sleep, it's activity, and it's mindfulness. And um, the first thing I would tell you is that I took sleep out of the four pillars in the last year. That sleep is no longer a pillar of health. It is literally the bedrock of health that the other three pillars stand on. So you have to get good sleep. The nutrition we've covered tonight. In terms of fitness, one of the problems with excess glucose is there's literally no place for the glucose to go other than be turned into fat. If you build your muscles, increase your muscle mass, your strength and mass together, it's literally considered a sink, as in a place for the excess glucose to go. So I believe that one of the hallmarks of aging is loss of muscle mass. Therefore, if you want to beat aging, increase your muscle mass. And, and again, so I, I'm the oncologist, and I have all these men with prostate cancer who have been technically castrated maybe temporarily, we give them medicine to reduce their testosterone. And when you think of testosterone, you think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rambo, bodybuilding, The Rock. Lack of testosterone, they get these tiny muscles. So we encourage everyone to literally become a bodybuilder. And it might be slow, it might be uh, once a week, uh, three times a week, but we think that strength training and strength building is critical. I don't think that the cardio, you know, if, you know, end of days comes, how fast you run a 5K is not going to be the, the measure of success. Um, I think that you need to be strong, you need to be flexible, and have a reasonable degree of, you know, of um, cardiac training, but you don't need to go all out on your cardio at the expense of not lifting weights. Uh, all, all the women post-menopause know they must lift weights, prevents osteoporosis, builds muscle strength, uh, creates a great form and function. Right. So I think there's a lot of understanding that, you know, resistance training, um, weights, um, you know, really helps to keep up the body mass, uh, a good, the, like, you know, good body um, composition of uh, yeah. density and muscles. 
Um, so then what about the other notion that, you know, when you have a workout, you know, you get hungry, you know, more hungry after that, like Kyle, do you want to talk about uh, any experience with your clients and how you deal with it? Or is that sort of just for you? It's all about the reward. I mean, that's the problem. Like, Hey, Kyle, let's go work out and, you know, and, and we did such a good job at spin class. Now we'll go get cupcakes and coffee at the Starbucks. That's kind of the problem that people have gotten into with this reward piece. And you just have to substitute the reward. You have to find, and again, that gets back to the mental, to the gut questions and the, the, the neuropeptides, but strength training is important. Um, it, it doesn't have to be expensive. You can do it at home in lockdown. You can call the Cathalon and they'll give you an $80, you know, resistance band, which will be your best friend. But the reward thing is hard. You have to figure out um, how to reward yourself differently and, and figure out where your gratitude is, what you're happy about, um, and, and the food is addictive, and it's not, it, uh, it's not the individual's fault by far. Um, the, the food industry has done a very, very good job, food science, at constructing food that we want to continue to eat. And if you don't think that they construct food, just take a look at Pringles. It's literally an architectural achievement. So <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, anything you want to add about, you know, this whole exercise? No, so I, I fully agree with Steve. I think most people do sufficient cardio or some sort of cardio, but what's lacking is the resistance training or the strength training. Um, especially that's why we see so many um, skinny diabetics right now, because they just don't, especially Asian skinny Asian women who look like, you know, they have a nice body shape and all that, but really there isn't much muscle there. And because Typically, in a normal person, the muscle is the organ that takes up the most amount of glucose from your blood. When that is lacking, you just have the glucose just has nowhere to go. It becomes fat or it just stays in your blood, and that's where that sugar level tends to go up. So, you know, if you had to do something for physical activity, um, definitely building the amount of lean muscle you have would make a big impact. All right. So, uh, approaching the end of the session. So I just thought I would have you two sort of briefly wrap up uh, on, you know, what are some key tips that you might give to our audience today on, um, you know, how to, how to focus on diet and nutrition uh, during this lockdown period whereby everyone's sort of stuck at home with kids, with multiple Zoom sessions in a day, uh, meeting, working from home late till night, um, some, you know, quick tips that you might have. Okay, so a couple of things. Make sure your workspace is not the kitchen. Make sure that you, you, you do not go to the kitchen any more than you would go to the pantry at your office. Uh, second, exercise every day. I'm very fond of telling my patients, uh, Kyle and I both have some patients who very, it took a lot for them to come to the office and ask for help. These are people who have serious metabolic derangements, disorders, and, and health risk. And they've certainly never run, you know, 5K, and they haven't done a push-up. And I like to encourage everyone to exercise every day. And I, I try to get them to, to either do a jumping jack or a plank, okay? And I'm pretty sure everyone in the, in the room knows what a plank is. And what I want people to do is, if you can plank for five seconds, and you do that every day, if someone asks you, do you exercise? The answer is, yes, I do, every day. <laughs> no one's going to ask you for how long do you exercise. So what I would encourage everyone to do is challenge themselves to build a new habit. Um, if it's jumping jacks, jumping rope, buying a decathlon you know, resistance band, um, but doing something every day, and frankly, right now, do it twice a day. If, you know, if, if you're just planking for 10 seconds and you're getting into it, you've never done anything, do it for 10 seconds twice a day. It's, you know, it, it's not that, that hard. Um, it's more emotional challenge than it is physical. But once you get over that, you're a huge success. And you can tell people, this is something I do every day. 
and creating routines, healthy routines. I guess that's what I would want to leave with is use this opportunity, the lockdown, to create healthy routines. Even while you have other coping mechanisms that might be negative, at least you're doing something positive every day for yourself. And I would throw out there, you're setting examples for family, for older and younger, is, is set the example for how you want to behave because everyone else will follow you. Wow. Well, I mean, these, these are very interesting times. And I think um, one thing that I would encourage everyone to try to do is to cook your own meal at least a couple of times during this, during this, um, this period. Uh, I think that, why, why do I suggest that? Um, a few things, you become a lot more aware of what goes into that food that you're putting into your mouth. Um, and you might discover that it's actually easier than it looks. And we all know that um, cooking meals yourself that's one of the ways to know exactly what's going into your mouth. You know how much sugar is going into that sauce or that seasoning that you're putting on your chicken or, or on your lamb. Uh, and you're also then aware of how to moderate a lot of these um, things and build that awareness. All right. The only thing I've seen go up higher than the COVID infection rate in some countries is the Google searches for banana bread. I don't know what's the obsession with banana bread, really. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But so cooking is great. Just, you know, make some good choices there. But that's a great idea. Great. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that, that was, you know, uh, we crammed in quite a bit in a very short one plus hour. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the key takeaway that I get is that, you know, there really isn't a quick, easy solution out of managing a diet it's going to be i mean it's it, it could be easy it could be quick but it's it's not what people traditionally think about like oh you know if just do this one thing it's going to get you where you want to it's about finding out you know that journey for yourself and really understanding what makes you get to that final and uh, that you know that that long-term journey that you're going to be on so uh with that i you know i'm really sorry that we couldn't get to a lot of the questions that we have here or maybe we touch a little bit on that um, I will hand over to um, Novi to close us off. Novi? Sure. I'd like to first of all give a big thanks and round of applause virtually at least to Ian, Kyle, and Steve for their time and insight today. Obviously, Thank you, Ian. this, this uh, topic is really timely and it's clear that we have real subject matter experts in the field on the call. So I think we all benefited a lot from it and hopefully you all enjoyed as well. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Mary Kuo, our president emeritus and a member of the global CAA board for the, all the time she spent in organizing this event and, and making sure that it happened. So thanks again to Mary. Uh, also thanks to Rebecca Wu from the Harvard University Association of Alumni in Singapore and John Tai from the Penn Warden Club for their support of tonight's event. If you enjo enjoyed tonight's event, we have five more events this week. It's a particularly busy week. I sent some of the details in the, the chat, so uh, you can feel free to sign up for our newsletter. Two are actually jointly organized with Penn and Harvard. On Friday, we have a wine tasting event with a Penn and a Columbia alum. And on Sunday, we have an all high B hit workout uh, with uh, former Olympic sprinter, Calvin Kang. The following week, we also have an all high B trivia event. And since some of you messaged, my, um, my nickname is Novi, but I have no formal relationship with Novi Health. It's merely a coincidence. Um, so just to clear that up. But thanks again to everyone for, for joining tonight and especially to Ian, Kyle, and Steve for their insight and time. Thanks again. Novi, Novi can I say one thing? Absolutely. If, if Kyle's up for it, um, we can tackle some of the unanswered questions and maybe you can put them in your newsletter um, and, and, or, and or contact information for both of us if they have questions specific to metabolic health or cancer related things. Sure, that sounds great. And a few of you also asked about whether tonight's session was recorded. It is, and we can follow up with the link to that as well. So thanks again. Thank you thanks, all. Guys. All right, thank you. Okay.